to the metal voice. We got a first timer here, Alan. First timer, popping a cherry, tracing guns himself. <laughs> I'm a virgin. I'm ready. Hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Okay. The look LA there. Guns. That's what we should say. LA Guns Black Diamonds uh, going to be released April 14th on Frontiers Records. Yep. And like Alan said, finally on the show, Tracy Guns. He's here. We got him. We nabbed him. We got so many questions. This might go on for a few hours, Tracy. <laughs> it could. It could. <laughs> The, the older I get, the more questions there are. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. Tracy's got a life we don't, so. Uh, yeah. Alan, go ahead, man. No, no, hey, I mean, uh, listen to the album. Congratulations again. Uh, what's this, your fourth album in the, since yeah. 2018? Yeah, oh. something like that. Are you, what's uh, what's your secret to success of re for having all this uh, prolif prolific output in the last couple of years? Boredom. <laughs> you know, it's pretty simple you know you buy mannequins i play the guitar you know everybody <laughs> has something they do so, so so tell us about this the musical direction on black diamonds versed checkered pass like what did you do differently musically or you just kept the same formula i you know it's always such a mysterious question to me too mm -hmm. um you just kind of got to go with whatever comes out, you know, I mean, um, LA guns isn't specific. Like some things that I do are very specific and, you know, I can focus on a sound or, you know, a, a vibe or something like that. But LA guns is kind of all over the place and it always has been. So it's like, you know, the playground, the giant sandbox where all the other kids left all their toys in it and you get to play, you know, with, with, you know, these trucks, these balls, these jacks, these shovels, Kind of thing and so i really don't put much as far as as musical limitations with la guns you know so uh i guess you guys are familiar with la guns so i mean there could be you know some extreme metal and reggae on the same album you know what i mean it's kind of just as long as phil sings it sounds like la guns that's kind of my rule of thumb yeah i agree i agree I think I think you even squeezed in an album with uh, Michael Sweet during this last yeah. period, and that was very specific. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> no reggae on that one. Yeah, there was no reggae, and now I'm working on that second record right now. That's what I just started uh, demoing up those songs. Cool. Yeah, Michael Sun Sweet. Bomb. Yeah, Sun Bomb Two is oh, coming. Okay. So, so you it's know, always writing stuff. The, the Reign of Guns and Moses. <laughs> Um, but you guys, you guys go way back. You guys go. How long you known Michael? Um, I've known of Michael since I was about sixteen or seventeen. We didn't become friends until two thousand eighteen. Believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know him before he was a Christian? Uh, I knew of him, but no, I don't think so. Rock's regime, like right, right. Back yeah, I think day. they, but I think they were Christian too. I'm no, not I sure. think no, that there was a transition. It was sort of like they start off like this, and then they sort of. Converted. Yeah, they were, they, they, like they, started, out, they like? started out a bunch of Jews, <laughs> and then they said, "Fuck this Jew shit." Now we're Christians, so let's change the names. Right? <laughs> in a way, an awakening. I don't want. I don't want to rain on Michael's parade, but it was oh, like an yeah. awakening. We'll call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 great, and Striper's great. They're so heavy I'm now. Striper. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Big so time. tell us about like I'm listening to this album, and I mean, I'm hearing Led Zeppelin. Oh yeah. I, I mean, is this a conscious decision? To sort of like, hey man, we're going more hard rock and blues here with Led Zeppelin. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is Jimmy Page is probably a hero of yours. Well, he's he's my whole reason for existence. So, you know, I'll never <laughs> deny that. Um, some things just really sound like Led Zeppelin when I write them. You know, and then especially you know because we do everything remotely now, so it's not like everybody's in the same room and like, oh, well, I got this riff, mate. You know, give me a drum beat. <laughs> so when I send you know, a piece of music off to Adam Hamilton, who's our drummer in, in the studio, and he does everything. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell him, yeah, play exactly like John Bonham and, and you know, get that sound, you know, and he's like, all right, let's do this. And the opening track, You Betray, actually, Adam had recorded that drum track on his own without any music and sent me the drum track and said, hey, you know, could you write something to this? And 
we never even edited the drum track. I just put the drums up. I started playing for about 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, this is the immigrant song. <laughs> you know? so, so, I mean, you know, so that one, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty zeppy. Um, but I mean, my, my production style and the way I record and the way that I want to hear the layers is very Led Zeppelin. But that really also comes from guys like Andy Johns and Eddie Kramer, those engineers, producers that worked with Zeppelin that I also worked with when I was younger. Um, and to me, you know, you're not going to do better than Zeppelin. You know, I mean, there's it's just not never going to happen. Gonna so happen. when so, so when something comes out of me that sounds pretty zeppy, I make sure that we take it, you know, to the extreme, you know, to make sure that you know I don't get caught in in retro land. You know what I mean? To make sure, yeah. you know, if I'm going to write something from 1970, well, you know, better use modern production so it doesn't sound exactly like that you know things like that so there's tricks to kind of get away from it um so la guns doesn't sound like a zeppelin cover band and you know and phil for years is, is i don't know if it's complaining he's like you sure a lot jimmy page mate <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah i, I do the reason i exist yeah uh, yeah you know i do and you know, I figure if page you know borrowed from his favorites you know that i'll just borrow from jimmy page then yeah, why not? A pretty good example that you've got to borrow from somebody. That's not a bad guy to borrow from. So yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to borrow from you know any, anything less. You know, <laughs> just a few guys, and then but most of the stuff um, that doesn't sound like Zeppelin, you know, that just kind of channels through, and it's an amalgamation of many influences and 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 styles, and and I mean, the guitars are fun. I, I, I think that's what I like about you as a guitarist and a composer. Like you take a song like Diamonds, yeah. and and I think you like knocked it out of the park. If this was Thanks. the '80s, this was sort of been like, okay, maybe not the Ballad of Jane. It's a, it's kind of in that vein, but it's right. I, I don't know. I, I I think I would call it. I, I don't know organic. I, I don't know like. That would be could be played on the radio. That guys would love it, girls would love mm -hmm. it. It's just Alan. Yeah, how would you describe one. it? Like it, it's a big one. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's 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 one of my faves off the album for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the you know every, everything from the arrangement of the music to the vocal to the lyrics to the sound. You know, it, it's just one of those ones that you spend. A, you know, I spent a little extra time on um, kind of orchestrating the guitars because you know we don't have the luxury of hiring orchestras and, you know, yeah. we don't have the luxury of hiring anybody. So, <laughs> so, you know, I got, I got to spend the time, you know, to really do my best Jimmy page kind of production deal on something like that. But, you know, it's the end of the day, you know, I must've listened to that song a thousand times since I got the, the mix, you know, six, seven months ago. And you're right. I mean, if any big artist did it at any time in history, it would be a massive hit. I, and I'm aware of that. Because you know, I mean, it strikes a nerve. The lyrics, yeah. the vocals, and the music all strike this nerve. It could have been written by The Who. It could have yeah. been written by Led Zeppelin. And Anybody. that's the shame of today's society where mm -hmm. the music industry, well, something like this will get lost. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially, you know, you got to, you got to have a $27,000 budget just to go to radio. Yeah, just, yeah. just to, Hey, here's my, my 27 grand, see what you can do. You know? So, you know, our label doesn't do that. So it's, it's, everything has to be the satisfaction of people that are LA guns fans. But number one, for me, you know, I make records that I want to hear now, you know, um, without any, you know, pretense of, you know, we're going to, be a mega hit you know they have to be hits to the band we have to love them and then our fans love them and that's where our success lies right now that's it yeah. i was watching a sound city doc yesterday and they were saying you know there's something about everybody being in the room at the same time and and you, you think, hey what was that you just did what was that little groove you did and and now you said you're everybody's recording separately yeah what's, what's your take on on both of those situations um, you know, I've done both. Obviously, our first few records, I mean, a lot of the records were done that way. For me, um, <clears throat> you always end up isolated anyways. Yes, you can go and you can play 
you know, record the drums and you track the guitar and maybe some bass, but you always go back and fix it. You know what I mean? You, you know, when you record like that, you're trying to get the best drum take, you know, so, so maybe the drummer gets the luxury of listening to the band, you know, the bass player, guitar player kind of going back and forth and pushing and pulling. But I don't feel that it's that much different um, the way that I do it because, you know, I record the guitars to a click track very loosely and then that goes to the drummer. So with me playing bass and playing guitar to a click track, they're very loose. You know, they're, they're, you know, it's not perfection. It, it never is with us. Um, and then I find that later, you know, when I get that drum track, I'm able to play around the drums instead of right on top of the drums. Okay. And the, the the luxury of time is what is the difference. You know, back then it's like, get it done, you know, go rehearse for a month and then get in and then hit record. And there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen, man, you know, <laughs> that way. And some of the, some, some of the producers, engineers were great. And some of them just have their own ideas. And with LA Guns, it's just, it's my vision, you know, and, and it's what my ears want to hear. So there's a lot of struggles in the early days, you know, a lot of, of friction and not so much arguing. I mean, there were arguments, but I mean, but it's just a lot of compromise, you know. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, a producer would say, oh, you need to really shred this up or you need to lay back on this. And most of the time I felt the opposite. <laughs> most of the time I'm like, like, yeah, the music's going really fast. Maybe the solo should be slow. You know, maybe it should be listenable. Maybe it should be this, you know, cut the tempo in half for the, the lead guitar or a really slow song where uh, you know, you got to liven it up. You got to make some dynamic happen and then play something fast over it because it's more of a surprise. Um, and since I only listened to 10 rock bands my whole life, pretty much, it's like, they're, <laughs> they're the out. best band. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to take their advice. You know what I mean? I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend anything like that. Hold on one second. This, this is my third X. <laughs> Your third uh, where's the check yeah no, kind of wait there you guys are uh-oh i see you're wearing an orianti shirt that's ori yeah she has new merch yeah she's not my ex yet <laughs> <laughs> the current current we call her yeah she's my my current love okay that's nice. that's nice that's nice um, so as a producer you know, we have Michael Sweet. He's been a guest on the show since we started uh, the Metal Voice, and he's always saying, "I could go back and listen to something. Oh, I should have done that different. I should have done that different." What, how are you uh, as a producer? Um, there's a lot of stuff on the early records I do that with. You know, um, God, a number of things. Um, not so much uh, arrangement choices or song choices. A lot of questionable notes and some solos sounds things like that uh that's what i was talking about that compromise earlier um but like black diamonds checkered past these two records i think i got them right like i listened to them all the way through and and there's i'm not inspecting them you know like some of the other ones uh waking the dead's like that too it's just from start to finish i love that record you know, no, 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 no little, uh, no cringes, <laughs> you know, but there's some stuff on some earlier stuff. That's a little cringy. Totally. I think, yeah. I, I think you've, it, it's the times, right? Now you have the time to fix those mistakes. Like you said, whereas in the past, Hey man, that's a hundred bucks an hour for the studio time or whatever, oh, a thousand dollars an hour. You're in, you're yeah. out. Let's go. Let's go. You know, kind uh, of. That, yeah, but in a way I, I, that that inspires creativity too. To Alan's point, the cues, right? Like you're getting inspired, and 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 mm -hmm. sometimes that spontaneous inspiration is what makes greatness. Sometimes, sometimes, it, sometimes it's a complete failure. But on that's another. Yeah, story. yeah I mean, I, I, <laughs> look, you know, I mean, there's a lot of moments, right? You know, uh, recording albums and demo tapes, and you know, playing with musicians live, you know, uh, other musicians and stuff um and in la guns live too because we improvise a lot 
So there's a lot of those like, whoa, moments um, when playing, you know, with humans at the same time. There's no doubt about it. And I can re I can remember those kind of moments as early as like nine, 10 years old with my friends, you know, in the garage. Um, but you're making records, right? You know, you're recording records and just the, the word record right a record it's a re it's a record of a of a document it's a record of a sound it's a record of a visual it's a record and it lasts forever so for me and phil like i said you know we really make the records for ourselves now so that we are happy you know musically so that we listen to them so that so that our time's not wasted you know that's what it feels like a lot of times you know you you spend a year on a record, you know, with, with other people, engineers, producers, management, and, you know, even the business manager has to throw their two cents in, you know, and the records are great, but you're just like, yeah, you know, why did I listen to that guy? <laughs> you know, why, why this, why that? And, you know, and you do those things when you're younger in hopes for commercial success. You know, you just do, you, you, you trust somebody else because, they have had more success in their past than you. So if you're smart, you know, you, 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 well, let me get this right. If you want to be smart, you listen to your gut because your gut tells you personally what's going on. But if you want to be right and you want to make friends and you want to be logical, then you listen to your, your older peers that have more ex experience. But art has no logic. You know, yeah, and that, point. and that's what you come to. You know, is, is it's a realization at some point where art is not logical. You know, and that's what makes art interesting. Is that yeah. it's like, whoa, you know, I wasn't expecting that. Wow, you know, oh god, it's sound. You know, and that, oh, I can relate to what that guy's saying. You know, all these things that go into just one minute of recorded music. You know, the, there has to be, it has to be interesting. And that's the thing that I'm a stickler with is, is we don't have a lot of songs that. You could strip the 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 vocals and lyrics away from the music would still be interesting, you know. And that's kind of my job in the band is is to make sure that the music stands on its own. Does, you know what? We'll we'll jump into past a little bit, but before we do on the new album, give me one sentence that <laughs> describes this new album. This is for headline purposes. What one sentence that describes your new album? That's a, that's, a, that's a tall order of fries. Uh, it's marketing. Let's see. Uh, you met me on the street. I'm a complete stranger. And I go, hey, Mr. Mr. Guns, you have a new album out. What it's about? How does it sound like? What does it sound like? It's the greatest hair metal album ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever. That's what you... Ever. Okay, ever. Okay. <laughs> and if I say to you, I don't know what hair metal is, what would you say? Well, it's the, the medallion you wear around your neck and, and it's got a beard and mustache. It's hair metal. I I, I, I don't even know. Um, when I think of hair metal, I think of really bad clothes <laughs> and and hair sticking up all over the place okay and hot chicks all right there you go that's what i think of when i when i think of hair metal all right all right okay let's jump I, into you know past. since you brought it up hair metal i've been reading this i just finished this book nothing but a good time and you're 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 one of the major guys in here. They, they, right back to your high school days when you formed yeah. uh, some of your earlier bands. Yeah, because I'm hair metal. Oh, there you go. You know, so yeah, Rich Beanstalk's a good friend of mine. He's the guy that put the book together. And, uh, you know, he, he ropes me in on all the good stuff. Like, you know, what color are Nikki Six's underwear? You know, <laughs> <laughs> are we talking 84 or 85? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but yeah, when, I mean, when did the, uh, you know, I, I, you I about it. hair metal like, for you when when did the kind of that whole scene the sunset strip scene 
start dying out or, or died out? What year? Ooh, really? I mean, I guess it started getting just real silly around 89. Okay, you know, 89. Just, okay. Just where, where, you know, there was more emphasis on fun and getting dressed up than music at some point, you know. Um, you know, to me, Poison is the ultimate hair metal band because they had great songs admittedly they didn't care about being virtuosos you know um, bob Dahl would always tell me you know i want to be successful and i want to have songs that everybody can sing right now you know um and they did that you know and they you know they're into the dolls but they were also into into the suite and they were and they were into scorpions and aerosmith and, mm -hmm. and all these things so to me, like that's really a great, successful hair band. You know, they weren't trying to stretch the boundaries of rock music, um, which is a which is a, a great to know that early on when you're putting a band together. You know, I think that has a lot of foresight, and that is logic that works for Poison for sure. You know, um, and then you kind of had Warrant which was like the five piece poison with maybe a little bit more you know emphasis on the musical side of things but still the the big song mentality you know um especially for the time you know that they were they were great at that um and then there's dirty ass little la guns you know? <laughs> so 89 was the year that things started getting a little ridiculous and maybe redundant even well here they did you know in la for sure you know um we were going to more alternative clubs by that point because going to the Zaris and the troube and and the whiskey and roxy at that time it was just kind of like seeing the same band over and over again and i mean it's fun you know it was fun but you know i mean being a musician the type of musician I that I am, you know, I've, I've always been into the dirtier side, of, like garage rock, for example, and and you know, kind of psycho, dirty rockabilly kind of stuff, punk rock, obviously. But then I also love metal, you know, like real metal, um, you know, Maiden and Def Leppard's first record, stuff like that, was a had a really big impact on me, especially because at the time. All I was really listening to was like Van Halen, Ozzy, Sabbath, Zeppelin, and Aerosmith, and Ted Nugent. Um, but then those records came out, you know, Def Leppard and uh, Maiden, and really changed my point of view. You know, like, wow, so you can take all these great sounds and neat things and kind of condense them and actually write a normal song, you know, over slightly sophisticated rock music you know nothing progressive i also love rush i always loved rush well we're um, canadian well, so i mean this is our calling card it's rush. yeah right i mean wow what a, hey? what a <laughs> hey a rush hey eh? um but yeah they they had a huge huge impact i mean i think you know in my garage bands you know all the way up through high school we always played rush especially 21 12 stuff you know just just so into it and it was so heavy and and Alex Lifeson, you know, not underrated, but certainly under celebrated as a guitar yeah, hero. Exactly the way to say it. Yeah. You know, he's he's just such a guitar god to me. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Talk about somebody who can play reggae or any style of music. Yeah. He's definitely one of them. So and he's so snotty. I love it. <laughs> you know, he's, I'm just gonna jump back and forth in moments in history. Alan do it will do the same. A lot of people know this and a lot of people don't know this. You were in Guns and Rose, right? It wasn't Guns and Roses, correct? It was Guns and Roses. It was Guns and Roses? Okay. Yes. I mean, how long were you in the band for? Like, is it a month, a year? Like, how long was it? In? It was a year. So, you know, Axel was singing for LA Guns. We yeah. did a gig. There was a big throwdown with our manager uh, based on a big throwdown with another band we played with that night. Uh, our manager fired Axel, but we all lived together. 
we sat on the couch. We decided what we were going to do next, and it was Guns N' Roses. That's all we did. We just changed the name, and we added Izzy to L.A. Guns. That's the whole story. And were you rehearsing those sort of like the uh, the songs off the first album at the time, or? or... Well, we were playing them in L.A. Guns, you know, a lot of those songs. And so like Mr. Guns. Brownstone. Uh, no, no, not Mr. Brownstone, but uh, Don't Cry, Anything Goes, Think About You, uh, a bunch of them. Yeah. Okay, so so you actually helped in the compositions or the arrangements of those songs back in the day, I guess? Yeah, some, yeah, some of them, yeah, because me and Izzy lived together. So um, by the time he was in... Uh, well, by the time we had Guns N' Roses, when he, basically he joined L.A. Guns, I guess that's an easier way to to show the transformation. Um, Izzy had some of those songs. They had played them in Hollywood Rose because earlier Izzy and Axel were in a band called Hollywood Rose. Yeah. And um, they had some of that stuff. And when Slash was in Hollywood Rose, they wrote Welcome to the Jungle. Um, but for some reason, when we got together as Guns N' Roses, we didn't play Welcome to the Jungle. I don't know why. I don't remember the thing about that. But that was always a favorite song of mine that they had. you know. But I think we were going, when I was in the band, we were heavier than what people know as Guns N' Roses now. It wasn't as wow. blues-based, a little bit more metal. Um, so more straight ahead, uh, more L.A. Guns-ish, really. But were there any yeah. songs that you said, you know, you lend your hand to it and you say, you know what, I wrote that riff and that sort of still exists in the songs today? Well, I mean, I do that with everybody. So, <laughs> you, you know, you know, that's that's how it goes. Because me, that's a piece of history. You know, you're with the band for a year. It's only yeah. normal that the ideas are going around. They're exchanging, you're finessing the songs, yeah. you know, of and, you know. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, they say, write a word, get a third. You know, that's kind of this old, <laughs> old standard. But real rock bands don't do that. You know, it's like whoever's in the band at the time when a record comes out, you give everybody equal credit. You know, I mean, kind of learned that from Led Zeppelin, right? You know, you read, mm -hmm. look at those album covers and things like that. You want things to be fair and you want things to be, um, what's the word? Uh, condensed and look strong and like a unit. Right. United. Yeah, United. So, United, yeah. you know, so like a lot of records don't have uh, everybody that played on an album, for example, or uh, people that made smaller contributions and, and things like that, you know, because it's just it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of stuff that goes into making a record, especially with Appetite for Destruction, because. Like it's so easy, for example, was also written with Wes Arkeen. And nobody knows how much of the song he wrote. Is it just the lyrics? Is it just, you know, did he write the riff? You know, did he write this? It's very nonspecific all the time. You know, it just will say, you know, words and music by these guys, you know, kind of a thing. And it lends to the great mystery that rock and roll is supposed to have. Like who did what, and you know, and that's what trivia buffs are all about. You know, they want to get, <laughs> yeah. they want to know. And I do that with a lot of recording stuff, like uh, '50s and '60s stuff, because you know, particularly bands from the Netherlands. Like for some reason, in the late '60s, their those albums sound like they were made in the '90s. They're they're like insane. <laughs> like, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. And why does you know, the seemingly kind of weird sounding production on Led Zeppelin records and Jimi Hendrix records, you know, compared to today's standards. It's like, how did we get from those recording standards to these recording standards? You know, like how, what's the big shift? So that's like a constant rabbit hole I go down as far as music production is like, like, damn, yeah, you know, everything sounds great now. You know, I mean, even if it's yeah. a terrible song, you know, everything <laughs> sounds great and clear and separate and all these things where, you know, the engineers from the 60s in, in England, they were maxed out. You know what I mean? Like they were really making loud records and getting great drum sounds and all these things, but it's still quiet compared to today's standards. Like, you know, you put Van Halen 1 on when I was 12, it was the loudest thing you ever heard. It's like, man, you know, woo <laughs> Now you put it on like next to an altar bridge record and it's like, man, that's little, 
know, <laughs> it's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Alan? Uh, no, I mean, I, I had to... Go ahead, Jim, I had one. Oh, yeah, just going back to the new album, of course. I I do hear a lot of the punk punk influence on it, and I would call this album like four to the floor. I mean, this is, you know, Some of it, it's yeah. really, uh, really, really hits hard on a few songs, so... Yeah, I, I think a lot of that has to do with Adam, our drummer. Um, he's getting more comfortable as the years go on and really pushing things and his recording techniques change a little bit from album to album. So there are some songs on this album, the energy is just wow. You know, just like, whoa. And, you know, Johnny and Ace really contribute mostly to that up-tempo, high-energy stuff more than I do. You know, they bring in the song ideas and then I kind of arrange them into a song and then Adam gets them and then I don't play on those till after we get the drums back. And then I really go for it then. But I don't come up with that much fast stuff anymore. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Adam because I'm listening to the drums on Wrong About You. It's just blowing my mind. That's, that's crazy drumming on that song. Yeah, if this if this album came out in, I don't know, 1985, Adam would be hailed as the, the leading drummer. Yeah. You know, he is amazing, you know. Really? And, and I, look, I played with some guys. <laughs> I've really played with some guys. <laughs> Adam Hamilton is the world's best kept secret. You know, he is amazing. And he records that. You know, it's not him just playing. He's recording yeah. and getting that sound. And, and you know, and that's without me really, like I'll turn in a song like Wrong About You to him without any direction. I'll be like, well, here it is. And then that's what I get back. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, yeah, oh my God. You, it's you, know, true. Like, you know, playing it to my grandma, like, listen to this guy play drums. You know, I mean, that's how good he is to me. You know, that's my opinion of him is he's just insane and he played on sunbomb and, and he's playing on the new sunbomb and he also played on i have an album coming out with todd kearns that band's called uh blackbird angels and that comes out in september and adam played on that wait till you hear that the drums are nuts man, he's amazing you stop you don't stop you don't stop creating music man once you open that can it just keeps coming out right the fizz everything kind of well i didn't write anything for about four or five months now until I had to, I got my notice in the email box, you know, uh, uh, it's time to get the new Sunbomb record going. I'm like, ah, I'm not ready. I don't have anything. And then I sat down one night, you know, and I was like, man, I don't know, you know, do I have this much metal in me right now? You know, <laughs> I was really under the impression I did it. And then I went to my girlfriend's and we were talking about it and she kind of played something and she's like, well, you know, something like this, you know, so one of hers might end up on there. And then that gave, that kind of opened like a floodgate, you know, just having somebody give you an idea, you know, like, like, yeah. And then I came here back home and I banged out seven songs in three oh. hours. Wow. You know, it's just because when, when the, when the floodgate opens, it opens, That's right. you know, That's right. and it's like, Part, 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 part. It's like, oh, I have this part. I have to put something around this. Okay, this naturally flows into this. This naturally flows into that. And then that's all voice notes on the iPhone, right? And then, of course, I didn't tune my guitar to any specific tuning. So now I'm going back to demo those songs, and I'm having to tune my guitar to the voice memos, you know, <laughs> because it's not anywhere close to, you know, any traditional tuning when it's just sitting in the living room. Um <laughs> So yeah, now I'm just in that process, you know, and I think that all 11 tracks, drums will be recorded and finished within two weeks, and then I'll start wow. really putting the finishing touches on it. Then Michael gets it, and he writes the lyrics. Wow. Good Tell process. In, yeah, it is. Tell me in the few minutes that we have left about the, uh, the Randy Rhodes documentary. I watched it. I enjoyed it. You know, um, well, you know, you narrated it. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. it's a big job. I mean, I mean, I'm sure it's, it is a big, it's job. a big compliment too to narrate something of that mm -hmm. that legendary, right? So, what was the yeah. feedback like? I mean, I know there was some sort of uh, Ron Sobel. He used the footage 
that he, you know, that was reused, but it was still uh-huh. done in a good, in, in a very proper manner and, 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 and honored the legacy of Randy Rhodes. But what it was really your does. feedback from it? Um, well, the feedback that I've gotten from it is people are just grateful that it exists, you know, that they're like, wow, you know, these quiet riot years and these things, a lot of people didn't understand them or they didn't know about them at all. Yeah. Um, and how I got, and why I got involved was Andre Relis, the direct, the director. Um, and uh, see what love does. I get a text from my girlfriend and I'm like, <laughs> is she upstairs? Is she upstairs? And you're downstairs? No, she's at her house. We don't live together. Okay. Um, my um, wife texts me and she's upstairs. <laughs> yeah. It's like, get down here right now. You left the ashtray next to the bed. why are you yelling at your computer no i'm not doing a show <laughs> yeah 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 um so it was like oh, oh randy rose randy Sorry. rose um uh, okay so andre relis contacts me and i got really nervous because i'm really good friends with randy's brother and sister Kelly, and Kathy. we uh, and we have always said that we would never do anything to do with randy unless it made sense unless uh, somebody else wasn't going to make money off it. Like it wasn't a cash grab kind of thing. So I talked to Andre about that. I go, so, Hey, you know, what does Ozzy, you know, what does Sharon Osbourne say? What does, uh, uh, Kathy say, you know, Oh, they're all against it. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, well, Hey man, you know, th- those are my people. And I really shouldn't do this without, their approval getting this done and and he said well i understand your your thing but i'm doing it anyways there's no league nothing legally binding that says i can't do it and i had to think about it at that point because i knew that if i didn't do it they would just get anybody to do the narration and then it would be a big sore spot forever right so i agreed to do it after I saw the documentary and I read the script and like you said, it, it's really complimentary. It's really put in a positive light and it's very truthful. You know, it, 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 I think it spells out the truth as close as it could be. And, and I can proofread that because I played with Rudy Sarzo for a year. I was on a tour bus basically with Rudy Sarzo for a year. So, and I'm obsessed with Randy anyways. Now I'm in a band with Rudy and he's telling me <laughs> everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it gets done. I do it. And it was a big job. You know, we did it in my studio. Um, I was in Denmark the night before, flew 10 and a half hours, got a couple minutes sleep. And then we spent 10 hours doing that, you know, wow. starting at 8 a.m. Um, I had, a, I had a, a speech coach, the director, his assistant. And, you know, there's like four people behind me doing this for 10 hours. And it turned out great. And, you know, Kathy hit me up and goes, I can't believe you did this. I didn't answer her for a couple of days, you know, because I really had to process the reason that I did it. You know, why is it a positive thing? Why is it a good thing? Why does it make sense now? And I told her, you know, why I did it and, and, um, and that I wanted to tell her after I had done it and explain those reasons. But she found out before it was actually made public so ultimately she agreed with me you know she said well it it is good that it's you and i wish you would have run it by me and i said well i didn't run it by you because you would have talked me out of it and then somebody else would have done it 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 was going to get done um so i think that at the end of the day which is now it's been out two years now um I think that that it was very successful, number one, but I think that we all feel good about it, you know, and and it leaves a lot of room for the Aussie years. Like if it ever gets done, you know, they don't have to go back here to this beginning kind of stages yeah. of Randy, yeah. you know, because an Aussie documentary about Randy would be a full 90 minutes on its own. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's. There's footage there. You know, a lot of people say there's no footage of Randy. There's a lot of footage of Randy with Ozzy. Um, but they're That's very unseen? protective. Unseen footage? With oh, absolutely. Guys. Of course there is. Of course but there you, is. You haven't but, seen it. You haven't seen it. No, You're just no, assuming. no, no, no. No, I, no, I'm not assuming, but I haven't seen it. 
I I I know it. You know, there right. there there's and the, the that type of footage is uh you know been collected over the years. Um uh, a lot of it's VHS um uh, quality, a lot of it's bootleg. Um but the 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 Aussie camp you know they only used bits and pieces of it for like let's say they made the crazy train video which is like 20 years ago already yeah. but you know they they're they're protective over Randy and, and they should be but I do think as with this documentary is that that fan base is getting older now and when this came out, it was finally a biscuit. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, man, I love Randy so much. So my fear is that they never do anything with Randy in the Aussie thing. And then nobody gets to enjoy that. You know what I mean? And because right. I think Randy Rhodes fans are really passionate about Randy. And they deserve to have, you know, inside look of his life. I mean, look, you know, with Hendrix... There's an abundance of commercial footage and bootleg footage. And still releasing songs to this day. <laughs> to this day, you know. And, and I love that, being a Hendrix fan. You know what I mean? Like, wow, something I didn't see before, something I didn't hear before. And Randy's no different. You know, Randy is the only hired musician to come into a band and revitalize the main attraction's yeah. career, yeah. right? Yeah. That's how powerful it is. On that note, and I'm just going to end off with this. I've been to Musonia. You know, I've talked to Kelly. I've talked to Kathy. I've done a whole little thing on Musonia, and fans went nice. nuts. And I went inside. We spoke. Yeah. We, we looked at everything around there. We we had a huge conversation. I did a whole little mini roads documentary on it. And the Amazing. fans loved it. They ate it all up. And uh, and rightfully so. I mean, absolutely, such, such a legend. Yeah, I mean, and Kathy and Kel, they're so sweet. Damn. They're so nice. They're such good people. You know, they're so they love their brother's legacy so much. They love their brother and their their mom, and you know, nothing but positivity comes from those people. You know, yeah. and uh, yes, and that's why they're very protective. I think. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. On that note, L.A. Guns. Black Diamonds on Frontiers coming out April 14th. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for being on the show. We had, I had like a ton of questions to ask you, but time is limited. <laughs> when the other albums come out, we'll have you back on to promote the other albums. Thank you very much, guys. Tracy, I hey, loved great it. Talking and to again, you. so many more questions I want to ask you. So let's do this again, please. Congratulations on the album. All right. Thanks, Alan. Right on, you guys. Bye. Have fun. All right, take care.